that are coming back, I have a, another marathon weekend ahead of me. I have a, I'm on my way to a rehearsal, then I have a gig tonight, and then tomorrow I have a really high-stress Catholic mass wedding, uh, followed by uh, a private party I'm playing, and then Saturday, another wedding. Uh, and it's I have to coordinate with different musicians for each of these events, and there's just a lot. It's just a lot. So I'm saying all that by to say, you know, I it's just kind of my busy season. Now, in the past, I taught more during my busy season. Um, this year, it, it really seems like these messages on Ephesians need space to, I guess, to marinate. I, I don't have a strong feeling to keep going and going and going. And like I said, I feel like people's hearts are really stressed and really weighed down... Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just want to speak not something so doctrinal, but something that comforts. Um, and I'm waiting on the Lord to give me utterance so that when I do speak, it's actually, you know, right on target um, for people. So the frequency of the message is slowing down. Uh, you know, pray for me for utterance and uh, for my own heart to stay in the Lord, too. You know, I'm, I'm very distracted right now I'll, uh, with just family life and music life and uh, you know my work and all the stuff it's gotten real busy um, after a couple years of really feeling like I had a lot more space you know to uh, I just think things feel stress more stressful right now even the, you know my pace hasn't picked up per se um, compared to you know wedding season year before COVID well, I guess I did have a year off. I think it's hard for me to get ramped back up where I had so much open time because of COVID and everything got canceled and now this year I'm busy. It, it's not busier than it was two years ago, but I'm less conditioned for it, I guess. Anyway, I'm going to shut up talking about me. Um, so we're talking about, we're going to go into Ephesians 2 here. And remember in the in the New Testament, the chapter numbers were added hundreds and hundreds of years after the canon was closed. Paul didn't write a chapter 2 and then come back and write chapter 3. This is all one train of thought. Um, we often make the mistake of thinking that we're talking about something new when we turn the page to another chapter, but we need to keep it in the context of what he's talking about. Uh, and he's been talking about, he's praying for us to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, to know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. And then we've been talking about this power. The power is the means that he accomplishes his purpose by. And the power is resurrection. Resurrection is the greatest power that's ever been exerted. Uh, just like the initial creation, God spoke. And everything that's happened really came out of that speaking. Uh, it's, his word is so powerful. Well, the new creation is produced by resurrection. All of it comes out of one act of power, which God already operated in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And now that power is operating towards us. It's streaming towards us, and it's going to carry us into eternity. And everything that happens in the new creation and eventually even the new heavens and the new earth, comes out of the resurrection of Christ. It is the creative element of the new creation of God. And it's the creative power. Uh, you know, resurrection is the incorruptible, imperishable life of God himself in Christ that cannot be held by death and can't be touched by corruption and uh, remakes us into incorruptibility and refashions us in God's image ultimately makes us members of the body of Christ and and makes Christ head over all things to us uh, you know there's a psalm that talks about well I think it's Psalm 110 where it talks about the high priesthood of Christ and he says I've sworn and, and will not repent you are a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek forever and one of the things he says is your people will be willing in the day of your power. Our willingness comes from his power. And we're of the eighth day, the day of resurrection, the day of the new creation, the day of, the, the day of Christ. 
uh, we are of that power, we're of that day, our life exists in that light, um, we're in a whole new sphere. We were delivered from the authority of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son of His love by a working of power in the resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ. And then that power reached us and regenerated us and brought us into this new realm called the, you know, the Spirit. We're no longer in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his Spirit who dwells in you. There's a new source of power for the Christian life. And, uh, but that power is not for us to release. I said in the last message that I used to look at this prayer like, if I understood the power of God, then it could be released in my life. No, that power is for us to realize that the power of the resurrected Christ and the authority he has in resurrection made him head over all things to the church which I am a member of the body of Christ because I have that life. And that means everything in my life is under the headship of Christ. Nothing is there by accident. It's a, it's a vision that gives me reason to rejoice and have peace and be settled and to know I'm in God's hand. You know, I'm just, I don't have to worry. It's not that I have to exercise the power. No, God exercised the power. He's already done it. He did it in Christ. And what he's talking about in Ephesians 2 is a continuation of that power. He's still talking about the power which made raised Christ from the dead, which God operated in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power. It says in Colossians that he stripped off the principalities and made an open show of them, triumphing over them in his death and his resurrection. He stripped them, their hold off of us and he blasted to the heavens like a rocket by the power of God. And he's seated at the right hand of God and he's upheld in the, he's, he's upheld in the power of God at the right hand of God. He sits on a throne of resurrection. That throne is full of the power of, resur of that was operating in Christ when God raised him from the dead, it, which is God's own life. It's his might. It's his glorious might. Uh, Paul talks about in Colossians that we would be strengthened with all power according to his, I think, glorious might. That's what we're talking about. It's the glorious might of the Almighty God that he exercised when he raised Christ from the dead, seated him at his right hand, and everything is, he's waiting for his enemies to put a, made a footstool for him, right? And he is head over all things to the church, which is his body. And now that power has reached us when we believed we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. That life, that power came into our spirit and also the authority that surrounds that life entered into our sphere. I mean, everything in your life has been uh, arranged by God and is subjected to his authority. You may not believe it because there's all kinds of negative things, but remember... His power is manifested in our weakness. This is the age where we're still in the body of humiliation. We have a treasure in an earthen vessel. He says, "My, you know, I will boast in my weakness so that Christ's power may tabernacle over me. Paul became more and more conscious of the power of God in the resurrected Christ in him to the point where he wasn't worried by his troubles. Uh... It's pretty amazing you know we can kind of get a glimpse of it in his words but I think only through experience do we really learn that there's something in us called resurrection that always comes back up and I've used the example many times that a pastor gave to me when I was a new Christian and I was easily discouraged and there was a pastor who told me that resurrection in me is like a buoy and the thing about a buoy in the water is the further you push it down under the water the more it will spring up. Like, if you push it down two feet, it'll spring up like two feet. But if you push it, push it, push it down, 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 and hold it, 
when you let go, it's going to blast off like a rocket. <laughs> and I have found in my Christian life that, you know, when I hit trials, there's always a spring back effect from resurrection on the other side. And in fact, sometimes God pushes me down so that the life in me can spring up, you know. Um, there's a bubbling up fountain that is of that incorruptible life that cannot be touched by death, can't be held by death in us. And so you may be feeling really discouraged today and really backslidden or dry or just, you know, out of sorts and in the flesh. But and if you've tasted that life before and you've tasted the hope and the encouragement from the Holy Spirit and the comforts of God, you're going to taste it again. It always comes back, you know, and it's a guaranteed thing. I see people who I can see they're on the decline spiritually. And what I mean is that they were full of inspiration, full of utterance, full of curiosity, full of wonder at the word of God. And now their appetite is sour, you know, and they're just not into it right now. And they're drifting off into the, supposedly into the world, you know, they're just watching TV or whatever. They can't take it anymore. Their heart is weighed down. I don't, I used to worry and go, oh no, you know, here they go. And I, and I used to, if I was in a group of people and we saw somebody go in that way, we would try to be more spiritual around them and, and try to encourage them and try to help and try to, you know, remind them and, and it just makes it worse. Uh, now I know just leave them alone because I know about the life in them. I know about resurrection. I know about Christ in them. This life is a person. It's a power and a person. And that person is a high priest who's ever lives to intercede for us. And he's been appointed to live forever. And he serves us as our high priest in the power of an incorruptible life. And in our weakness, he's touched with the feelings of our weakness and intercedes with groanings that are his own, that are beneath even what we can utter. And he has all authority in heaven and earth. And he prays according to the will of God. And that is why Romans 8 says that all things work together for good. If you look at the line of thought in Romans 8, it comes that we know that all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It comes out of the fact that the Spirit has been given to us, that we have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan within ourselves, and the Spirit groans with utterings when we don't know how to pray as we ought, because he who searches the, mind, the hearts praise according to the will of God. That's Christ. That's our high priest. That's the life in us. That's the law of the spirit of life. God, Christ has taken responsibility for your life and your condition even, and is interceding to bring you into the next season of fruit. And we do go through seasons of pruning back and fruit bearing, pruning back and fruit bearing. And not all fruit that you bear is something you're going to see. Sometimes our fruit to God is just, Lord, have mercy on me. I, I trust you no matter what, even in the spite of all my circumstances. And, and I feel so weak. I just cast my cares on you. Help me. That's fruit. That is something of his life coming out of his intercession as a fragrance to God. And he walks in the garden of your heart and he senses the, he senses aromas that we can't sense. And it's all a pleasure to him. And I've said before that I believe he's bottling all that up to be like a wine for us when we enter into the uh, joy of our salvation. You know, when we're transfigured, I had that dream where this cup of this bottle of wine was held in front of me and it had my name on it in golden letters. And I said, yes, I would drink of the cup of the salvation of my salvation. And when I drank, I was just full of joy. And it was a picture of the rapture. I knew that. Uh, and I knew that that came from my vineyard. And God showed me that that was a personal tasting of all of the fragrances from this garden in my heart that he had cultivated and, and already enjoyed all my life that I didn't know about it. Now he's, he's processed it and bottled it up so that it'll be a taste and a memorial for all eternity. Um, but all of this 
comes out of the resurrected life of Christ. It, that, that fragrance is a mingling of his resurrected life with my spirit and into my soul. When I'm groaning and feeling weak and the high priest is interceding for me and there's a fragrance that goes up as a result that even feels like misery to me, it's still resurrection. Okay? Uh, that's what we see. That's the, that's Pauline spirituality out of 2 Corinthians. You know, we who live are always being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in us. God is interested in manifesting that life in us. And that's the power, you know. But here we're speaking of more objectively. God has already operated in Christ. He's already sent the power. The power is already working. And it's already completed the masterpiece of God in eternity. But we're still in the process, you know. So for us, it doesn't. We just, we need a revel, spirit of wisdom and revelation to see this power. Because we feel so weak. So he, that's what he's been talking about. And he put all things under his feet by that power and gave him to be head over all things to the church by that power, which is body, his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Now that word fullness shows up several times in Ephesians and it's associated with the, with the body of Christ. It's called the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. When it talks about the building of the body of Christ in chapter four, until we come to the perfect man, to the measure that belongs to the stature of the fullness of Christ, that's the body of Christ, filled with the riches of Christ himself to be his fullness, to be his expression. And then the other place, I think, in Ephesians 3, he talks about uh, that we may be filled unto the fullness of God. And then it says, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond what we think or ask, According to the power that is working in us, be glory in Christ and in the church throughout all ages. Amen. That is not just a pretty saying. The power produces the fullness. That's Paul's concept. The resurrection is producing the vessel, uh, the body of Christ, by filling it with the riches of Christ and putting the glory of God, which is the riches of Christ, on display in the body. We can't see it in this age, but the angels can. In the next age, it'll be fully revealed and we'll see what God did. Okay, but here in Ephesians, he's talking objectively about sort of like the doctrine of that power and what it produces, hoping and praying that we'll receive a vision of it because it does change your view of your life. It really does. It changes your view of your circumstances. It changes your view of what's possible. And it changes your view, most of all, about who's in, who's really in charge, you know. Um, so Ephesians two is a continuation. You know, it, this resurrection power made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's not period, amen. There, it goes on, and you has he quickened. See that power reached us, and now he's talking about us individually, uh, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in past time you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, there's another power, in the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, there's another spirit, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind were by nature children of wrath even as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together or quickened us or raised us up together with Christ. And he says, by grace you're saved here in parentheses, which is interesting that he's just got this little side mention. Uh, he doesn't go into a big doctrinal argument about works versus grace here. That, that was in Galatians, where all we could see is, how do I get delivered from this works notion? But now we're in the heavens, seeing from eternity past, from God's heart, and then we're watching God operate his mighty power his, according to his glorious might. And he's working in Christ and now he's working in us. And it's all according to grace. This is what grace is. Grace is the life of Christ. Ephes uh, John 1 says, of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Grace is not something God does or feels only. 
God, grace is God in Christ made available to us as life in an exercise of power that it's already been accomplished and exerted. That's the most powerful thing that ever happened. The resurrection of Christ. Um, and then he says, and, uh, and he's raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before prepared for us to walk in. That's as far as I'll go here with the reading, but see this all as grace. What you know, he started talking about it in Ephesians 1 7 when he said you know, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us, making known to us the mystery of his will, uh, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself with a view unto an administration of the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ. And then he said, you know, you have been, you, you have been ordained to an inheritance under the praise of his glory, that you would be under the praise of his glory. He's going to put the glory on on display on you. And you were sealed with the Spirit, who is the pledge guaranteeing that inheritance. And this, and then he started praying, because of all that, that you would see the hope of your calling, hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. God has an inheritance. Christ multiplied in the saints. Uh which is the body of Christ, which is Christ's fullness. And then God has a power by which he's accomplishing it. And Paul prayed that we would see it. And that power first operated in Christ, but he said, uh, he prayed that we would receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know in the knowledge of him. And he said, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe which he operated in Christ? Christ didn't have to go to death and resurrection except for our us, right? And that power that God operated in Christ is towards us. He already operated it, and then it reached us. And Paul, Peter said something similar when he said we were regenerated unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ regenerated the body. It's all one act. And God, it's not that Christ was raised... I mean, in time, Christ was raised as the first fruits, and then we, the dead in Christ, will be raised, and then we who are alive and remain will be raised up and caught up together with him, right? But, in God's, from God's perspective from eternity, that is all one work of power that's already been operated. He's already exerted it. It's already done. It's one act that raised up Christ and now has quickened us and made us alive together with him, and raised us up with him. Where? In the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, both in this world and the world to come. We are at the right hand of God in Christ. Uh, Colossians 3 says, you know, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Seek those things which are above where Christ is at the right hand of God. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. This resurrected power, this life that is our life, Christ is our life, is at the right hand of God. And everything has been made subject to it. But we don't see everything subjected to it yet with our natural eyes. But we look by the doctrine of the apostles, the ministry of the New Testament, by faith to Jesus Christ. And we believe and say, Amen, he's the Lord. That's what we're saying when we're saying he is Lord, you know. Um, not only is he Lord, but God's power made him Lord in Christ, and that power is towards us who believe, and that power made us alive. That's why we can say he's Lord, because no one can really call him Lord by faith without the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, which is the life of Christ. And that power raised us up and seated us in the heavens, and uh, why? So that God could show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for the ages to come. Now, Paul's thinking of eternity and the ages to come. 
He's not talking about right now. He's talking about outside of time. He started this epistle by starting an eternity past. Where we were chosen unto him before the foundation of the world. We were predestinated unto sonship. God's working all things according to the counsel of his will. In time and space, everything is working together to bring those who are predestinated into the sonship. And then he exercised a great power to make that happen. And now that power has reached us and raised us up. Okay, so that now we're kind of caught up to now, you know, with the resurrection of Christ, um, the power has reached us today. Great, but Paul's now thinking about the ages to come. And I wanted to say that because he mentions good works here, right? Uh, he says as a side note, by grace you are saved, meaning it's a given. You know, this is so big. This is not something you can work out. This is something way beyond anything you did. You were nothing. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead. You know, this isn't something you did. This is something God did. It's by grace you were saved. That's the emphasis. He's not talking about how to get saved. He's talking about what is the power behind it? What accomplishes salvation? And how great is this salvation? Well, this salvation seats us in the heavenlies in Christ in his position as co-heirs with him. Whatever he has, we have. Whatever he's going to inherit, we inherit. Whatever his position is, we are positioned in. He's our, you know, he is our life, our covering, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption, our glory. He's everything. He's our clothing. We wear him before God and he is our position. That He's our condition. That's how, how are you doing? Christ is the answer. You know, how's he doing? That's the truth. This is called positional truth. It's true of you regardless of what you feel like in your earthen vessel. But he raised us up to see us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show forth, put on display the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now remember at the beginning of uh, Ephesians 1.5 he said that he predestinated us unto sonship according to the good pleasure of his will. And some translations say kind intention. Just strictly out of his kindness. Okay, because he foreknew us and he loved us with a great love. Right? We were dead in our sins, but he was rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loved us. He didn't do it because we sinned and he felt sorry for us. He brought us into the sonship because of the great love he had for us from eternity past that he already knew. And we talked about that, that he's already spent the ages to come in, with us. He's already got the experience of showering that kindness on us. You know, with my son, I barely remember the day he was born. You know, I can kind of remember holding him and stuff like that. And yeah, it was a precious event. But when I think about my son, I think about the last eight years I've spent with him and all the experiences in it. That's how God thinks of us. He's spent the ages to come with us. So he foreknows us according to that knowledge. And he loves us according to that love. He loves us with a great love. And he made us alive together with Christ, raised us in the, up with him, seated us in the heavenlies with him, so that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace through kindness, uh, in his kindness towards us through Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, we understand that. For we are his workmanship. Now that word is poema which means masterpiece. Here's where it says the masterpiece of God, like a sculpture or um, a work of art that he's going to put on display. It hasn't been unveiled yet. And then it says we are his, we are his masterpiece, our workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, I believe that the good works Paul's talking about here are not just your good deeds in this life. They do include that. But the ages to come, God has exploits and works for us. And it says for us to walk in. It doesn't say good works for you to do. It says good works for you to walk in. Are they your works? You know, this whole thing, the building up of the body of Christ is the work of God. Who's doing it? God. But how? Through a ministry. By perfecting the saints unto the work of the ministry and through their function, they build up the body of Christ. Is that their work or his? It's his work and they're walking in it. And that's what we're talking about. There are works and there's an administration of the fullest times to head up all things to come. And there are administrations to come. Ages to come. Where works are planned. Whatever they, These are the works of God. 
And we're just going to walk in it. So again, the focus here is not on you. You know, all the all the grace people love to use this verse to say, see, we're not saved by works, we're saved under works. Right? And then the works people say, yeah, but you skipped the part about the works. The works people always focus on our works. But the point is, is they're not our works. This is the working of the power of God. And I believe that the good works also come out of the resurrection. God already exerted the strength for all the good works forever in the new creation in the resurrection of Christ and now that power is working toward us so that we walk in it okay and that walk is a walk in newness of life resurrection it comes from him um oh I need to I'm gonna have to come back to this I may have to do another message because I've my GPS is saying I'm at my destination, but this is not my destination, so I need to pay attention to what's going on. Uh, talk to you soon.